The plantation laborer working out in the fields is the most enduring image of slavery in America, but not all slaves were put to such tasks. Newly imported Africans soon discovered that their lives would differ drastically based on whether they were purchased by a rural or urban slave owner. An unknown number of Africans were imported to America and sold into slavery during the colonial period. They made the voyage across the Atlantic in cramped and unhealthy conditions upon slave ships. Approximately 10 to 15 percent of the men, women, and children aboard these vessels died along the way. Forty percent of those who survived were brought to Charleston, South Carolina to be sold at auction. Prices varied most significantly based upon age. A one-year-old child might be sold for $100 on average, while a 20-year-old might garner as much as $900. Slavery was coded into the DNA of South Carolina from the beginning. Section 110 of the Fundamental Constitutions of Carolina, written in 1669, proclaims, Every free man of Carolina shall have absolute power and authority over his Negro slaves, of what opinion or religion soever. With slavery legally provided for from the colony's inception, several large slave auction sites grew up around Charleston, including Dorchester Landing and Stono Bridge. In the city of Charleston itself, at the auction block in the old slave mart, the newly enslaved Africans' lives diverged down two separate paths, rural slavery and urban slavery. Rural slavery centered around the plantation. Most of the plantation owners in the land surrounding Charleston were British planters who had already made their fortunes growing sugarcane in Barbados. They brought their Caribbean agricultural model and their enslaved labor force with them. They initially in attempted to grow sugarcane in South Carolina as well. But the land would not support the growth of sugarcane, but they had these enslaved Africans who had a knowledge of rice and they brought the agriculture, the architecture, and the tools necessary to develop a system for rice plantation and exportation. It was a very labor-intensive system, and it required many people. The plantation owners exploited both the knowledge and labor of their slaves in order to make vast sums of money off of rice. Slaves from the Congo region of Africa were highly prized as their tribes had been cultivating rice for generations. Elite South Carolinian planters sought more and more efficient ways to use this generational rice growing experience to expand the yield of their rice paddies. The supervisors at most plantations utilized the task system with their enslaved labor force to organize the planting and harvesting of the rice. If you're working in the field, they're going to give you one task that they assume will take, you know, eight, ten hours a day, and however quickly you finish it, you're done for the day as soon as it's done. This eight to ten hour workday, however, was far from pleasant. Horrible conditions in the fields caused African slaves to develop trench foot from standing for long hours in the shallow water of the rice paddy, malaria from the mosquitoes that bred in the stagnant water, and heat stroke from the exposure to the sweltering Carolina summer sun. Despite the unpleasantness and danger of field work, the task system offered a modicum of free time for the laborers. The slaves, when they're doing this, well, they're given time, generally on these plantations, to grow some of their own food, grow some of their crops. It offsets what the owner has to provide for. Plus, it's a way of keeping them busy in their off time. While this system was intended to keep enslaved field workers too busy to contemplate rebellion or escape, in practice, it meant that these slaves were able to mingle during their off hours with the other plantation slaves who had also completed their tasks. All of this was done with very little supervision. The task system and the free time that came with it did not exist, however, for urban slaves. In the city life, um, you tended to have a bit of a wider variety of tasks to do rather than having one specific thing that you did, like work the field. Urban slaves filled many different roles. For many, their work varied based upon the occupation of their master. Coopers, who made barrels, carpenters, and blacksmiths all frequently relied upon enslaved labor for their business. 
In the city of Charleston, many of the wealthy inhabitants used their slaves as their housekeeping staff. These house servants were expected to maintain the home, thus freeing up the time of Charlestonian women to engage in high society outside of the home. A small percentage of rural slaves also served as the house staff in the plantation home. While housework was not as physically demanding as field work, house servants in both urban and rural South Carolina worked grueling hours. There was always kind of a debate, even back then, on, you know, who had it better. Now, most people today, you ask that question, and they're instantly going to say the house servants would have it better. The problem is, you're essentially on call 24 hours a day. As a matter of fact, that's why these slave cabins are located where they are. Uh, so you might find yourself having to sleep at the foot of the master's bed or right outside the bedroom door. If you have overnight guests, I mean, you could basically be working all the time. While no enslaved condition can be considered desirable, most historians agree that skilled artisan slaves enjoyed the most comparatively comfortable lifestyle in both rural and urban South Carolina. White slave-owning craftsmen taught their slaves the skills of their respective trades. In this way, craftsmen enlarged their businesses and the slaves who worked for them developed specialized skill sets that made them much more valuable than the typical field hand. Typically, if you look back at it now, the people that probably had it best are skilled artisan slaves. They're going to be mostly on their own. Uh, they have a certain amount of work they have to finish, but they're going to be unsupervised for most of the time. Rural skilled artisan slaves functioned on a similar task system to the field workers. They had a quota for the day, and after they were done, their time was their own. Urban skilled artisan slaves, however, often found themselves with even more work. It could also be rented out to other people as well if you had a particular set of skills. So if you knew carpentry and someone who didn't have a slave would be able to hire you from your master to work for them as well. Early in the colonial period, both urban and rural slaves were allowed to craft products and legally sell those wares on the side for themselves and not for their masters. This gave slaves, particularly the skilled artisans, the opportunity to earn money with which to buy their freedom. In Charleston, slaves were permitted to sell their goods at a specially designated slave market. In the countryside around Charleston, slaves would periodically be allowed to conduct commerce with slaves from neighboring plantations. This system of limited economic freedom was officially ended after the Stono Rebellion. In 1739, near Stono Bridge, less than 20 miles outside of Charleston, between 60 and 100 slaves revolted and killed at least 25 whites before being put down by the local militia. The following year, the South Carolina Legislature, the Commons House of Assembly, passed an Act for the Better Ordering of Negroes and Other Slaves in response to the Stono Rebellion. The law greatly restricted slaves' freedoms, especially the rights to convene, regardless of social and business purposes, in an attempt to prevent future rebellions. Section 31 of the law proclaimed, No slave or slaves whatsoever belonging to Charleston shall be permitted to buy anything to sell again or to sell anything upon their own account in Charleston. With the passage of this 1740 act, slaves were no longer allowed to gather to sell their wares in the market in Charleston, which further restricted their ability to earn the money they needed to buy their freedom. While the Act for the Better Ordering of Negroes and Other Slaves did codify further repression, it also, curiously, provided some new protections for South Carolinian slaves. Many white colonists, incapable of accepting that slaves might reasonably object to their status as property, looked for some other reason to explain the Stono Rebellion. One theory asserted that these slaves, many of whom were Christianized by missionaries even before being brought to the New World, were specifically displeased at being forced to work on Sundays, the Lord's Day. This theory provided a convenient explanation for slave owners, one that did not force them to question the morality of slavery as an institution. As a result, Section 22 of the Act for Better Ordering commanded, If any person in this province shall, on the Lord's Day, commonly called Sunday, employ any slave in any work or labor, works of absolute necessity and the necessary occasions of the family only excepted, every person in such case offending shall forfeit the sum of five pounds, current money, for every slave they shall so work or labor.
Due to the lack of legal representation of both urban and rural slaves, it is difficult to tell how effectively this law was enforced. In principle, however, it ensured that slaves could not be compelled to work on Sundays. This allowed enslaved populations in the city of Charleston and the surrounding area more time for rest, community, and their own religious services. Formal black churches were rare during the colonial period. Many urban slaves in Charleston attended white churches on Sunday. They were not allowed to sit with white parishioners, but many churches had designated areas for blacks. Some churches even mandated that colonists bring their slaves to church, lest those slaves form independent congregations that would promote a sense of unity and possibly rebellion. Many rural slaves, however, lived on spread out plantations where compulsory attendance in white church was logistically difficult. As a result, they developed their own separate and informal religious practices. It is from these rural religious expressions that the musical tradition of Negro spirituals developed. Went down to the river Jordan, where John baptized three. When I walked the devil in hell, says Johnny baptized me. I say, Roger and roll, Roger and roll. My soul During the colonial period, approximately 6,300 blacks, most of them enslaved, comprised over half of Charleston's population. With such a large black population, the question of burials became important. It was unthinkable to most white Charlestonians to allow slaves or free blacks to be interred in cemeteries alongside whites. The burial practices that developed were quite different for rural and urban slaves. Most plantations, such as Drayton Hall, situated approximately 12 miles outside of Charleston, had a separate cemetery on the grounds where slaves were buried. At the time, stone grave markers were a luxury, even for white colonists. Few, if any, slaves would have received a tombstone. Many of those graves are now unmarked, their wooden markers having long since rotted away. Though the cemetery at Drayton Hall is fairly small, many slaves must have been buried there. One ledger from Drayton Hall during the period records the names and relevant information of at least 90 slaves who lived on the plantation at one time. Without markers, it is impossible to know from the ledger who is buried in this cemetery, but likely many of the slaves whose names were recorded are interred at this spot. In the city of Charleston, however, many dead slaves were buried under the streets or thrown into the nearby Ashley, Cooper, or Santee rivers. This created a new health hazard for a town already beset by disease during the colonial period. The city of Charleston did not pass an ordinance to make this practice illegal until well after the colonial period, in 1805. Additionally, an official cemetery for slaves was never established in colonial Charleston. Thus, while we know much about the births, lives, and deaths of Charleston's colonial elite, from the cemeteries at St. Michael's and St. Philip's churches. Almost no historical record exists for over half of the city's population, its slaves. While slavery in America is inextricably linked to the transatlantic trade of enslaved Africans, many Native Americans were also enslaved. The colony of South Carolina profited from the Native American slave trade more than any other English colony in the New World. While this practice is tragic through the lens of history, the enslaved native population proved beneficial for the enslaved African population. A lot of the plants and trees and flowers and bark and roots that the indigenous people were aware of, they shared with those landlocked Africans who were adjusting to the new world. Particularly on the plantations, African slaves learned from their Native American counterparts and used this knowledge to develop folk medicine practices in South Carolina. At a time when properly trained doctors were scarce and medicine was rare even for the wealthiest colonists, a slave who became sick would very rarely receive professional medical attention. Instead, slaves used indigenous medicinal herbs that Native Americans had taught them about to care for their sick and dying. These practices were less well known, however, to urban slaves, who were much less likely to come into contact with Native Americans. Contact with Native Americans for black slaves became even rarer later in the colonial period, as the practice of enslaving Native populations declined. 
Their legacy, however, continued on in the folk medicine traditions of African Americans. After America freed itself from England, it took over 75 years before the young nation finally freed its slaves. During this period, the laws concerning slaves and the conditions in which slaves lived shifted, but the fundamental divide between urban and rural slavery remained in place until emancipation. Each group found different ways to cope with their often terrible situations. They frequently resisted their yoke in small ways, such as deliberately misinterpreting orders from their supervisors. Occasionally, they even rose up in revolt against the system that oppressed them. Throughout it all, both urban and rural slaves survived in the face of despair. Their resilience can best be remembered by taking time to learn about their lives. Discussing slavery is not comfortable, but the memory of slavery and the horrors that came with it should never be forgotten.